This morning's scripture reading comes from the New Testament, the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 to 26. Jesus came down from the mountain with them and stood on a large area of level ground. A great company of his disciples and a huge crowd of people from all around Judea and Jerusalem and the area around Tyre and Sidon joined him there. They came to hear him and to be healed from their diseases, and those bothered by unclean spirits were healed. The whole crowd wanted to touch him because power was going out from him, and he was healing everyone, happy people and doomed people. Jesus raised his eyes to his disciples and said, Happy are you who are poor, because God's kingdom is yours. Happy are you who hunger now, because you will be satisfied. Happy are you who weep now, because you will laugh. Happy are you when people hate you, reject you, insult you, and condemn your name as evil because of the human one. Rejoice when that happens. Leap for joy because you have a great reward in heaven. Their ancestors did the same things to the prophets. But how terrible for you who are rich, because you have already received your comfort. How terrible for you who have plenty now, because you will be hungry. How terrible for you who laugh now, because you will mourn and weep. How terrible for you when all speak well of you. Their ancestors did the same things to the false prophets. This ends today's reading. Let's pray together. Lord, as we assemble here, we turn now to hear you speak to us directly. Help us to open our hearts and our minds to you as we try to understand text in new ways, but in ways that may give us new light, illumine our paths in some new manners. And all of it, Lord, we ask your presence with us. Give us insight, give us hope. Give us courage to live your life as you've called us to live it. And may the words we hear, Lord, be your word and not the words of any man. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. In 1992, the German monk Henry Nouwen, you've heard me talk with him or about him before. He's a, he was a great writer and a great uh, example of Christian service and Christian ministry. Well, in 1992, Henry Ma Nowen preached a sermon at the Crystal Cathedral in California that really addresses the subject that we're talking about this morning. He addressed the concern about how we define ourselves. He suggested that it's probably in one of three various ways. First, we, ask how, we have to ask ourselves, who are we? Who am I? Now I know this simple answer. I'm Denny Emmerich. I'm the son of Joseph and Gladys, the husband of, of Francis. That's her name, isn't it? Yeah, Francis. Father of Chris, Eric, and Greg. But there's more to us than our name, although we carry that, and whether we carry history, we carry family history, we carry genes. Dave, can you cut this mic back a little bit, please? Dave, wireless one, can you cut it back a little bit, please? Soften it, please. There's more to us than those things that we observe. Because what's one of the really important things is how we define ourselves. And so Howen, uh, Nowen suggests that there are several ways we do this. He said, first of all, we define ourselves by what we do. Throughout life, our identity changes with our circumstances. For example, we're a daughter, a son, a mother, a father, a husband, or a wife. Or perhaps we define ourselves by our jobs. 
We might be nurses or doctors, car mechanics, truck drivers, or professors, or even CEOs of corporations, or many other things. Maybe we're a musician, a preacher, a meat cutter, or a baker. It's interesting that my mind put preacher and then meat cutter right together. I'm not sure what that means. I'm not even going to explore it. Well, perhaps we also identify ourselves as retired. Or another role that we play. At a different time and place in life, our identity may differ, though we are the same person. Our roles change, and we're more than our roles. We might define ourselves by what other people say about us. That's the second way. For example, I am good, bad, smart, intelligent, naive, dumb, a crook, selfish, a meddler, caring, careless, or even reckless, perhaps. So too often, we see ourselves through others' eyes, and unfortunately then, we allow others to define us. And sometimes what they observe is not at all what's in our hearts. So we need to be clear about who we are. Or according to Nowen, we might define who we are by what we have. We have compassion. We have strength, wealth, or status, for instance. And maybe we're just the opposite, perhaps by, the, by what we lack. Maybe we are jobless or childless cancer-free, homeless, or lack dignity. Today's scripture describes that consistent great divide in humanity about who we are. Jesus talks about the haves and the have-nots. And essentially, the Gospel of Luke is a great reversal for what existed in his day. So is Matthew, for that matter, but Matthew does it, treats it a little differently. Because since the tower, time of the Tower of Babel, humanity has been separated not only from God, but also from each other. We were cast out, Adam and Eve were cast out of the, of the Garden of Eden, out of paradise. And later, the Tower of Babel was formed. There was still one language, one people. They could actually talk to each other. And they didn't have to have uh, translators. But after the Tower of Babel, as the cultures developed around new languages that people had to understand, the separation grew more competitive and grew wider. And that separation is still evident in almost every culture. We can see it by viewing the broader spectrum of society God calls his children. And that's an important piece for us. It doesn't matter what language, what our culture is, we all were born of a common parent. Jesus in both Matthew's Sermon on the Mount and Luke's sermon on the plain defines the separators that delineate those who follow him. Each person in that crowd needed to ask, as do we. Just as we ask ourselves, who am I? Who am I? We need to find ourselves on the list of blessed and warned, if we are to be honest with ourselves. That is, we're on both sides of that. And sometimes I think this text has been taught, I don't want to say badly, but I think it's been taught from a particular prejudice. I think all of our texts are taught that way. We have an understanding and, and we, we preach it that way. I was interested to find some interesting new insights for me. Each of those who gathered that day on that, in that place and each of us who take our faith seriously must measure who we are by the teaching of the one whose name we take. The biblical context is that Jesus is calling us to know God as Jesus knows God. He wants to comfort and warn, and warn, I should say, not warm, warn his hearers. Remember, there's a great crowd on that plane that day, a huge crowd from all around Judea and Jerusalem and the area around Tyre and Sidon were in that crowd. Jesus, you see, was well known by, his, by this time as a healer. And people came because they wanted to see the miracles work. 
Sidon and Tyre is an interesting place for that to be mentioned here because that's over 100 miles from Capernaum. So for Jesus to, uh, to, uh, who, to gather people who want to come and see him that far away was a major, major witness to his popularity and how well he was known. Simon and Tyre not only weren't uh, uh, cities in this region, but they were on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And as port cities, they were known for their sin. So the presence of people here near Capernaum is an important indicator of Jesus' high, uh, widespread reputation. That day, the gathered people were hungry for healing from their diseases, bothered by unclean spirits, and they were hopeful. That's why they were there. They were hopeful. The same way that we're hopeful when we get bad news. The same way that we're hopeful when we get that news we don't really want to hear about our health. Or perhaps the passing of one close to us. Surprising or not. We, want, we come to the church. We come to Christ, hopefully. And on that day, they wanted to touch Jesus, the scripture says. We just read that. Now, Scripture also says that Jesus came down to a large plain where the crowd had gathered. And they were allowed to listen in as Jesus spoke to his disciples. That's right out of Scripture. This was not meant to be a large gathering. Jesus was talking to those who were already committed. If you, if you want to kind of put it in context, the disciples had just been called. That would happen back in, in chapter 5. So, you know, Jesus been, has been out there a while, and he's finally called them, and, and now here they are. And so he's instructing them. And what he's doing, according to verse 20, is that since he had already chosen them, he, he's not merely making a social uh, commentary. He's sharing the future with his followers by placing Jesus on the level ground rather than a mountain, as Matthew does, Jesus becomes more approachable. The level ground is more than just the physical level ground. He becomes less a preacher and more a teacher, a rabbi, instructing his followers. So when Jesus begins to address this crowd, he uses a little different language than Matthew reports. Remember, Matthew emphasizes the Jewishness of Jesus in his gospel. And that's who he's speaking to, the nation of Israel. When Jesus, uh, uh, Luke consistently writes his gospel for a broader, more diverse audience. Basically, Luke is not a Jew. He's Greek. He's a doctor. He's educated. And he knows a different language. And he speaks a different language. Now, when Jesus starts to speak, he says, happy or blessed are you who are poor. Happy are you who hunger. Matthew has it, blessed are the poor in spirit. It seems like Luke is addressing his words to those who with current real life situations rather than on the objective level of Matthew's language. Well, these are the only two instances of Jesus giving these teachings. And, uh, it, it's apparent for many scholars that it was something that he said more, than, more times than the two that are recorded. And I think these are really two different times that Matthew and Luke are recording. I think that Jesus, as many preachers do, and, you know, I'm waiting for somebody, and, and please don't do this to me, okay? But I'm waiting for somebody to come up and say, you know, that illustration you used was great the first time. It was okay the second time, but preacher, it's time to, time to get rid of it. Well, I don't think that that happened because the crowd was so large. But, you know, we, we get into places where we have our themes that we go through. And sometimes I have to admit, um, you get stuck on a theme. And you get too deep in it. So I believe that Jesus taught this same thing more than once, more than 
Matthew records come, as Jesus comes down from the mountain. By the way, mountains were very important in the scripture in the context of the revelation of God. Think about Moses. Where does Moses get his call? Mount Sinai. Where does Moses go to get the law, to get the Ten Commandments? He goes up on the mountain. Where does Elijah run after he has that great victory at Mount Carmel? He goes to Mount Horeb. And what's he do there? He hides. But he hears God. And so Jesus, on teaching, I believe the, the literary piece here is that it's more than simply high ground. It's symbolic of this is where God gives important words. And that will be true for the Jewish culture. So Matthew puts Jesus on the mountain teaching. Luke puts Jesus among the people on the level in the plain. So the differences of people is important. But those differences, as serious as they may be, for, for us, of the blessings and the warnings, if you listen to them, they've got to be disturbing. Jesus, according to Luke, while bringing hope to some in the crowd, also becomes judgmental. He doesn't say simply, blessed are you, you and then leaves. No, he goes on to say, woe to you who are rich, full, and when all people speak well of you. Now, that's not affirming language, and his, his professor probably wouldn't give him good grades on this sermon. On the contrary, it makes me uncomfortable when I hear it, given that those who even have $30,000 of annual income in America have more income than 95% of the people of the world. So yeah, by those standards, we all are rich. What does that mean for us? Does that mean we're excluded? Well, and as we'll see as we experience Jesus through Luke's gospel this year, it's a part of what gets him in trouble because he challenges the structure. Whether it's the Jewish government, not necessarily the Roman government, but certainly the way the Pharisees and the Sadducees are running the temple, makes him very unpopular and very suspicious. So these blessings and woes suggest a flipping of the roles of those gathered. That is to say, those who are disadvantaged in the crowd, those who might be referred to in a state of unsalvation. Now let me speak about this for a minute. Because there are some scholars who, who kind of understand that the word that's used for poor in the New Testament, the Greek word that's used for poor, is not about wealth or lack of wealth. It's really about, because it's a Greek word, it it's really has the connotation of those who have nothing. Those who have nothing. Those who have to depend on somebody else. Now just think about that. If you understand Jewish history, when Jesus lives, they are occupied by whom? The country is occupied by whom? The Roman Empire, right? Now, in most places where the Romans occupy the land, there's a temple. And do you know whose statue's in the temple? Jesus. Caesar's. That's the, so they understand who's in control. It's a way of keeping their thumb on the population. That's also, the population understands that because they pay their taxes to Caesar. But in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, there's nothing in the Holy of Holies. It's empty. Why? Why is the Holy of Holies empty except for a chest? Because Yahweh forbids it. Don't make unto me any graven images. Don't make an image for me. 
And the fact that the Sadducees and the Pharisees can control the population as they do is only by an arrangement with the Roman Empire. And the emperor can fix that anytime he wants to. Anytime. As a matter of fact, in 70 AD, the temple was burned and destroyed by the Romans because they were rebellion against the empire. And if you want to read some fascinating history, read about Masada. Read about Masada and the zealots putting, uh, going to Masada and, and how the Romans finally got to them. It's a great, a, great, a great read. Better yet, go to Israel and go to Masada. It's really inspiring. So Jesus is, is challenging a lot of stuff here. He's saying that the ones who have made it, the rich, will, the well-fed, and the laughing will lose what they have attained. Reminds me of the, of the story of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16. You remember the rich man ignored Lazarus until he passed into the pit of fire. And only when he thought Lazarus could bring him water and cool him did he see Lazarus. And then it was only for his own comfort. Jesus is preparing them for the days when their identity will change and they will hit hard times because they follow him. Now, it's in, important to understand that the context is that they're making a choice. And Jesus knows because he knows what's coming in his life. And we know what was coming in his life. That he would die. He'd be tortured. And he goes through that and says, you know, if you follow me, yeah, that's likely to happen to you. Now the Beatitudes as, as they're delivered, um, and I like Eugene Peterson's down-to-earth translation of, of the Beatitudes of Luke in the message. He says, uh, you are blessed when you've lost it all. God's kingdom is there for the finding. You're blessed when you're ravenously hungry. Then you're ready for the messianic meal. You're blessed when the tears flow freely. Joy comes with the morning. Count yourself blessed every time someone cuts you down or throws you out, every time someone smears or blackens your name to discredit me. It means that the truth is too close for comfort and that that person is uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Skip like a lamb if you like, even though they don't like it. I do, and all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My preachers and witnesses have always been treated this way. Wow. Notice he's not talking about if you get sick and you suffer. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a conscious decision to follow Christ where Christ leads us in, his, in our lives. No matter what it costs us. It wasn't long ago that I was confronted by, by a friend who asked... Uh, why aren't we doing more to support the martyrs around the world? And I really thought about that. I've been thinking about that actually it was a couple of years ago, and I'm still thinking about, about that. Because I get, you know, Voice of the Martyrs, and I get other mailings to talk about what we're doing, and whether or not the government should be doing more, I don't know. But I know this, that they're martyrs. They understand the cost, and they're willing to take it. And they're willing to take it because they know that it's part of the cost of being a disciple. The ones he's called in the previous chapter are just beginning to understand that. You know, they've left all that they had. Now they understand the cost of their decision to walk away from, from their fishing boats and somewhat steady income. Scripture tells us that some people more than the 12 that he called to be apostles, followed him for about three years. Now, have you ever thought, ever wondered, like, like I have, where'd they sleep? There were no days in, no motel eights or sevens or sixes for any matter. Where did they sleep? 
They often slept in the open air. And you know what? The treasury wasn't full. You know, what was Judas's concern? The bag's empty. And so he sells Jesus for the piece of silver because he thinks he's going to do something good. They often relied on the hospitality of others. Persons who were more affluent for their meals and their shelter. Remember Lazarus and Martha and Mary? You know, they put them up. The women, interestingly, uh, this is always a, you know, when we think about who supports, who supported Jesus, though the men went out, a lot of men went out, a lot of men didn't go out who were, who were Christians, and it was their wives who frequently supported the trips of Jesus. The road ahead for the followers of Jesus would be difficult and it would be treacherous. So living as a follower of Jesus would require them to reevaluate their values and how they lived their lives. They would be dependent on the generosity of others, be demeaned, tortured, and even killed for following Jesus. The psalmist and the prophets see that this is a condition of Israel because the Greek word for poor means someone who does not possess himself everything necessary to live. Has to depend on somebody else. And so the Jews were taught from the time that they could recite the Psalms, from the time before they were bar misfit. They were taught to depend on God. The psalmist and the prophets see this as a condition of Israel who has to rely only on the help of God. And according to scholars, Jesus is talking to these people who are the poor, those who are dependent on God, not necessarily who don't have things. These are the people who the empire, the population considers to be poor. Because those are the people who have to depend on God that are referred to here as the poor. Relying on God is the basis of Jewish and Christian faith. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 directs us, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on your own understanding and not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. And to be a follower of Jesus only underscored that dependency. On the other hand, the Roman Empire, its occupied forces, as I suggested earlier, you know, were in control. They could do what they wanted, and they only worshipped Yahweh. The people of Jerusalem, the people of, of Judea, only uh, worshipped Yahweh as an arrangement with the emperor. The Pharisees and the Sadducees essentially sold out in order to preserve their faith. Well, can you understand why Jesus' teaching, even the Jewish religion, could be threatening to the empire? I mean, they were always waiting for the liberator. That was what the prophets talked about. Now, the prophecies from Isaiah and Jeremiah had been, refill, uh, had been fulfilled years before this, but they were still being dependent on. And in 70 AD, as I suggested, the Romans actually destroyed the temple. So this sermon that Jesus is preaching speaks essentially of a great reversal. You may suffer now, but you will be rewarded in the end. And for those of you who are rich now, you'll lose it all. Rich or poor in this text probably is defined how dependent you are on God. The people of position will lose it. Unfortunately, as it matured, the church of Jesus Christ strayed from the great reversal. It became the government as the faith gained popularity. And all too frequently as it gained power, it abandoned the teachings of Jesus for the privilege of the ruling class. In his book published in 2019 by InterVarsity Press, Jake Meador provides a perspective in search of the common good, Christian fidelity in a fractured world. He shares, it's said that Thomas Aquinas was once brought to a great city where he was to meet the Pope. He, was, he saw huge churches, clerics in ornate garb, and great armies lined up to defend the church, the church's rule. 
And as he took all of this in, the Pope looked at him and said, no more can St. Peter say, silver and gold have I none, referencing the story in Acts 3, where Peter says those words to a layman begging to be healed. Indeed, responds Thomas, but neither can he say, rise up, take your bed, and walk. Since World War II, the American church has consistently chosen to chase power, prestige, and mainstream status. We've gained all of those things. The tragedy, of course, is that those are the very things that Jesus warns us about too frequently in the Gospels. A movement designed to obtain power and prestige and status will end up where Jesus predicted it would and where the American church has ended up. Modern American Christianity has never intended, was never intended to produce morally upright people given to sacrificial love of neighbor. If it were, if it were intended to do that, we would not continue to restore discredited, unrepentant leaders to roles of authority within the movement or excuse them in government. This understanding that we rely on for God, for blessing us, fundamentally in the practice of our faith. Rather than condemning those who have accumulated riches, the audience is those who were drawn to a deeper dependent relationship with God. Many of the people drawn to Jesus had resources to share. Some were members of the Sanhedrin and the affluent. Remember Joseph of Arimathea? He was a follower who claimed Jesus' body and laid it in his tomb, his personal tomb, which was still under construction. Now, these Beatitudes are easily meant to warn that those who would trust their wealth and, and privilege rather than trust God were in trouble. On the one hand, it was aimed at the Romans who controlled the lives of millions of people who kept the poor by authoritarian government. They were the folks who trusted only the power of their arms and the emperor. But on the other hand, it's very possible a warning to the followers to put their trust in God and depend supremely on him, lest they lose the life they trust most. We're coming down to the end of Epiphany, and in a couple of weeks we're going to start our Lenten season. And before we enter the season, we need to take a look at, uh, at what it's about, because Lent is when we're called to test and examine our ways to evaluate how we live and compare it to the lives for which we have been created. In the meantime, let us celebrate Jesus who promises much more than lives we have and the way they exist right now and tells us that when we live the lives God created us to live in an intimate relationship with him, we're blessed no matter what our present situation is. It's not a matter of how much or how little privilege we currently have. It's a matter of serving God by loving God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength as we love ourselves and love our neighbors. In other words, with all we have and do. Let's pray. Loving Father, we long to have your blessing. Please help us take inventory of our lives and behavior and how and whether we put our lives in your hands. Help us to see ourselves as blessed no matter what we face because we know you are at our side. When people dislike us and reject us because we serve you, help us to see the blessing. When we're in the midst of grief and when we're hungry, allow us to feel your presence and hear your voice of comfort. May we never be so rich that we trust our possessions and investments more than you. Bless us, Lord, in humble service as your servants, we pray. Amen.